Good morning, church. Welcome once again to our online service this week. And we want to thank God for a good week we've had. David said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of God. And I'm so glad that we are able to meet once again here. And uh, today we are trusting God for a great service. We're going to enter into a time of worship and after the worship service and everything, we're having Andy Barna preaching once again with that. Andy Barna, as I said the other time, is a friend of party, a friend of eternity, and he is uh, the senior pastor at Hingham Christian Fellowship. And right after service, after the worship service, he will be here to deliver the word this week. And stay tuned. Let's get into the worship. Thank you. 
Hello, my name is Louisa and this is The Church News. I hope you're all having a wonderful Sunday so far. So the only announcement I have is that on Wednesday we'll be having our midweek prayer at 7.30 online on Zoom. So if you'd like to join, feel free to get the login details and join us for our weekly prayer. So that's pretty much all the announcement for this week. I have to say that it was very enjoyable to meet people face to face um, in church and frankly speaking um, I intend to continue doing so. I know for many of you, you catch us online and it's wonderful that you guys are tuning in. But on the basis that you may have either the time or you feel that you'd like to see us face to face, please feel free to come down and join us in our face to face service on Sunday. So that's all the news for me, and I hope you all will enjoy the rest of the service. What an awesome time of worship. Well, it's time for us to prepare ourselves to give our offerings to the Lord and to God's word. And I want to read Exodus chapter 35, verse 20 downwards, and it reads, Then the whole Israelite community withdrew from Moses' his presence. And everyone who was willing and whose heart, whose heart moved them came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of meeting, for all its service and for the garment. Verse 22 says, All who were willing, men and women alike, came and brought gold, jewelry of all kinds, brush earrings, rings, and ornaments. They all presented their gold as a wave offering to the Lord. Now, this is quite a fascinating uh, piece of scripture. Moses spoke to uh, the Israelites and uh, they withdrew, went, were moved by their hearts, and then they brought their offering for the building of God's house, for the service, all the service in God's house, so that God's house and God's work actually can move forward. So today, as we bring our offering to God and to the house of God, I want you to just reflect on this. We are giving that the kingdom of God, the work of God will go forward through the vehicle of eternity church. So give your best, give knowing that God sees your heart and he is the one that rewards. May God bless you. After that, there will be the means of giving will come on the screen and uh, God bless you. Enjoy the rest of the service.
Good morning, Eternity Church. Uh, I bet you weren't expecting to have me back so soon, uh, but it is an honor and a privilege to be with you again this morning. You know, I heard of a preacher who was called in at last notice to stand in for the resident pastor, the resident preacher, and uh, it was very short notice. And so he was a little bit nervous, not quite fully prepared for the message. And so he started off uh, because of his nerves, he, he went to great lengths to explain that that he was a substitute preacher. And uh, he then, you know, went in, as preachers do, went into this big, long illustration of what the word substitute means. And he, he described, you know, if uh, your window breaks, uh, then if, if you can't get to the glass makers, then what you do is you, you get a piece of cardboard and you put that in the window frame but that is not your permanent window that is just a substitute because then as soon as monday morning hits and you can get to the shops you're going to get a pane of glass and you will you will put that in and so the substitute is not the real thing it is just a stand in and then he preached his message and got to the end and you know standing at the door greeting everyone this dear wonderful lady with a sense of humor comes up to the pastor and says Pastor, thank you so much for coming. And I need to tell you that you were no substitute. You were a real pain. <laughs> well, I hope that I'm not going to be a real pain this morning. Um, I do want to talk to you about one of my favorite topics, and that is coffee. No, 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 it's not. It's, um, it's the book of Hebrews. I love Hebrews. And so if you're in the mood for a bit of teaching, uh, let's let's pray together. God, we we thank you for your word and we, we ask that you would anoint not only my words as I try to teach, but I pray that you would anoint our ears and hearts as well. Amen. Hebrews is, is a wonderful book. Some facts about Hebrews, um, we don't know who wrote it. Many people presume that Paul the Apostle wrote it. Uh, but others say, nah, the Greek is, is too, it's too crisp, it's too clean, it's too, uh, it's too pure. It couldn't be Paul. It must be Apollos. Um, others have even been brave enough to suggest that Hebrews was written by Priscilla. But um, I, I guess you can imagine that that didn't go down too well. But whoever wrote Hebrews, it is a wonderful wonderful book and there's so much and I just hope that after my time with you this morning you're going to be encouraged to read through the book of Hebrews and to study it perhaps in a bit more detail. Who it was written to well all that we know is that it was written to Jewish people who had become believers and uh, they they went through a lot of persecution because of this because of their faith their families kicked them out uh, and, you know, we, we pick up some clues as to what conditions would have been like by uh, reading in chapter 10. It says, think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful, even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and you were beaten. Sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. And when all that you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You see, things had got to the point where family members could not see or, or bump into each other on the same side of the road. If a Christian was was approaching another family member who was still a Jew, not a Christian, the, the non-Christian would swap to the other side of the road. And this was without social distancing. This was social hatred. This was Christian persecution to the point where uh, their belongings were, weren't valued anymore. They, people would break into their homes and just steal them. And, and they had no recourse because the law presumably wouldn't wouldn't count for them because they were the dregs of society now. They were living in a time period where values had been completely turned around. You see, what, what they considered to be right 
everyone else considered to be wrong. And what, what they considered to be wrong, everyone else considered to be right. D just let that truth sink in for a moment. That kind of sounds like they were living in Norwich in 2021, when everything which Christians believe is right is considered wrong by the world and everything that the world considers wrong, we consider right. Values are just turned upside down. Now, if Hebrews was the only book in the Bible that we had, uh, we don't have the other 65, we only have Hebrews. Uh, do you know what the Christian symbol would be? A good guess. It, it's not the Star of David. Okay, I know we're talking about Hebrews, um, but no, it wouldn't be the Star of David. It wouldn't be the cross. It wouldn't be the fish. I would hazard a guess that if Hebrews was the only book that we had, the Christian symbol would be an anchor. An anchor. An anchor, you ask why? Well, because an anchor is what Hebrews puts out as the solution to the problem that the letter is trying to address that le the the problem is Christians drifting from their faith and so Jesus Christ is that anchor that holds us firm uh, and so in chapter 6 verse 19 we read we have this hope as an anchor for the soul which is firm and secure in chapter 2 uh, the, the chapter opens up with this verse it says we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard. Now, not just pay attention, but the most careful attention. Why? So that we do not drift away. So that was the problem that the writer was trying to address. Now, simple question. How much effort is required for someone to drift? I mean, imagine the scene you're uh, in the ocean uh, facing the currents or perhaps in a river with rapids and you are in a kayak or a canoe. How much effort would it require for you to drift? Answer, zero effort at all. Drifting happens when we do nothing. It takes effort to go against the tide. Now, as an illustration, let me introduce you to a man whose name is Pietro Bandinelli. Now, I'm not entirely sure how true this is. Um, I do know that, you know, Google comes up with some weird and wonderful facts. Um, and this might be one of those weird and untrue facts. I'm not sure, but I have heard this on more than one occasion. And so I put it out to you. You can check it for yourself. Um, Pietro Bandinelli is, is known for the fact that he was the, the, one of the models that, that Leonardo da Vinci used in painting The Last Supper. And in fact, Pietro was the model for Jesus. He, his face was, was uh, of that sort of nature that da Vinci thought, if, if I'm painting the pureness of Christ, I'm going to use this man's face. Something strange happened. Uh, near the end of the work, da Vinci was now looking for someone who he could use to portray Judas. And so he sent people out and he was looking for someone who was forlorn, depressed, ragged. And they came across this person sitting on the streets. And uh, they said, this person must be ideal. And so they took him to da Vinci and da Vinci used this man. And as he was finishing his, his work, he said to him, uh, sir, what is your name? And this man said, master, don't you, don't you know, don't you recognize me? My name is Pietro. Uh, I, I was here some time back. Life had its effect on Pietro to the point where he had drifted so much that he had gone from the face of Christ to the face of Judas. This is why we need to pay the most careful attention. You see, being a Christian means we are swimming upstream all of the time because the values that we hold true 
are not the values that society holds up. In chapter 10, verse 25, we get the answer as to how we are going to help one another to not drift. It says, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but let us encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We need to not neglect our meeting together. And I know this is, you know, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted because you have gathered either in the church building or you're watching this online. And so you are making an effort to gather together. Before lockdown, uh, the people who do surveys, uh, they did statistics and they came up with these 10 reasons why people go to church. So they asked churchgoers, why do you go to church? And then they ranked their answers in order of priority. And so the top reason why people go to church, and these are really good to get closer to God. So my children will have a moral foundation. Third reason, so that I will be a better person. Number four, for comfort in time of trouble. The sermons are helpful, and I really hope that this will be helpful to you. To be a part of a faith community. To continue my family's religious traditions. I feel obliged to go to church. To meet new people. Or I get dragged to church by my spouse. Um, that was quite a common one. The tenth most common reason. They also asked people who don't go to church why they don't go to church. And they said things like this, I practice my faith in other ways. I am not a believer. Attending church is not important. I haven't found a church that I like. I don't like the sermons. I don't feel welcome. I don't have the time. I, poor health or mobility issues were a reason. There's no church in my area. I don't have transport. These were the reasons people gave as to why they don't go to church. And they can be summarized into three categories. People say, I can't go to church, I don't believe in Jesus, or I don't think that it is important. Somebody may ask, but why is going to church, why do you say going to church is important anyway? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that going to church is important. Well, you are absolutely correct. And, um, you know, my, my friend Davidson, uh, he would know this book quite well. It is the Wisdom Laws of Cricket. Um, Davidson and I share a passion for cricket. And um, in this book, the undisputed laws of cricket uh, you can find every law that there is to cricket but you know nowhere in this book does it say that in order to play cricket you need to be a human <laughs> um, that's because the book is written by humans for humans it is assumed that if you are reading this book you are a human being and so there's, there's no need to mention, in order to play cricket, you need to be a human. It is assumed. You know, there's another book called the Bible. And most of the New Testament is written to churches. The, the membership of a local church is assumed. I mean, Paul writes his letters. He, he says, you know, I'm writing to the church in Corinth. It, it is assumed that if you are reading this book, you are a member of a local church. But yet today, that value is, is not held as high as it was in the time when the Bible was written. It's sad, but true. In another part of Hebrews, we read this. For God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked. Now, I, I read this verse to bring out that the people to whom Hebrews was written, they weren't people, they may have been drifting, but they weren't people who were lazy in 
you know, living their, their faith. They, they didn't start out that way. They started out as being passionate for Jesus, but something happened which caused them to drift. And that's why it says you've got to pay the most careful attention to this. Why did they start to drift? Well, we're not sure. People far cleverer than me have put down three possible reasons. They've said perhaps they started to drift because they became disillusioned. Because you see, at that time, they were expecting Jesus to return like now, <laughs> but he didn't. And so they, they became disillusioned. Another possible reason is because they were tired of all the persecution. You know, how much more can you face when your family members will not even greet you? They won't walk past you on the same side of the road. How, how, how long can you put up with that? And then the third possibility is they just lost interest. They became apathetic. Now, my question is, do you know anyone who is perhaps feeling a little bit disillusioned? Um, you know, they, they're drifting in their faith because they started off with fire and vim, but now you've noticed that they've, they've just kind of drifted a bit. Um, obviously, the, the question is for yourself as well, but, but I'm assuming that because you're paying attention to this message, that, that you're still doing okay. But maybe you need to take note of this for yourself. But do you know of anyone who, who has become disillusioned with their faith? Do you know anyone who has perhaps been hurt uh, by the persecution? Or in our context, you know, uh, sometimes people are, are hurt by the church. People come to our church um, and you know, they, they've come from, from situations where they've been spiritually abused. Uh, praise God for your leaders at Eternity Norwich. Good leaders who will not spiritually abuse anyone in their care. But, but not all churches are like that. And maybe you've, maybe you've joined Eternity uh, from a place where you have been hurt. And I, I, I'm really sorry for that. Um, but don't let that shift in terms of your your understanding or, or may may that cause you to drift at all in your faith jesus will never disappoint you do you perhaps know someone who's just become apathetic in their faith you know they, they started serving god but now they they just don't care they've gotten involved with the things of the world and they no longer care we need to encourage them you know, in, in chapter 2, verse 3, it says, How shall we escape if we reject so great a salvation? This salva Sorry, what's that? Ah, yeah. <laughs> the clever ones among you have picked up that that's not what the Bible says. Uh, in fact, the Bible doesn't say it, we read it. <laughs> um, the, the Bible doesn't read like that. It doesn't say, How shall we escape if we reject? It says, if we ignore so great a salvation. You see, if you reject the salvation, well, then you wouldn't be sitting listening to this. Then you are no longer a believer or you weren't a believer in the first place. But if you ignore it, it means you've received it, but now you're no longer giving it the attention that it deserves. You're ignoring it. And it says, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation. We're not going to escape. We need to pay the most careful attention. We need to not let anyone drift, which is why we need an anchor. One of the, the strongest anchors that you and I can have is church. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. But let us encourage one another, especially now. You know, to the Hebrews, they said, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. That is still true. But I would want to say, especially now, post-COVID, when people have the fear of going out, we need to encourage one another to keep 
coming to church. Let us encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened. C can you pick up the urgency in the writer's thinking? You know, in, in verse 24, the one that comes just before verse 25, how's that for good mathematics? Uh, verse 24, the one just before where it says, let us not neglect uh, our gathering together. It says, let us consider how to spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together. Let us consider how to spur one another on. You know, in the message, it says, let us see how inventive we can be in encouraging love. Let us see how inventive we could be. And so as I draw this to a close, here is your mission. Here's my challenge. Here's your mission, should you choose to accept it. I challenge you that in the week ahead, that you pray and seek to be the most inventive or the most creative in inviting people back to church. Can you do that? This is your mission, should you choose to accept it. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would give us your creative ideas, that we would think of how we can encourage our friends, family, loved ones to, to slot back into their local churches. Help us to do this, Lord. And Lord, I, I pray too for everyone who is listening to this, who the challenge is, is not so much to, to reach out to encourage others, but, but they actually need the encouragement for themselves because they have noticed, especially listening to this talk today, they have noticed that they have begun to drift. I pray for them, Holy Spirit, that right now you would flood their heart and minds with your love, your grace and your peace. May their faith, may their hope in you be an anchor, firm and steadfast. And I would also like to pray for you if, you know, you're listening to this because you're really excited to learn what it means to be a Christian, because you know that this is the decision you've got to make, but you haven't made it yet. Friend, this is so easy. Yeah, it may seem scary, you know, before I became a, a, a believer, I imagined that, you know, um, it was like taking a step, the this, this step of faith was like I needed to cross this chasm, which was so deep that I couldn't even see the bottom. I, I was actually scared of what it meant if I became a believer. And um, I found out that it was true. I did need to cross over this chasm, which was very deep. But it was only an inch wide. <laughs> it was so easy to just step over. All I needed to do was to place my trust in Jesus. And I did that through praying a prayer and then doing my best to find out everything the Bible said about how to live this life and joining a church and getting involved and joining, connecting with other Christians. And I'd like to start you on that journey today. But just, just pray this simple prayer with me. You may want to do it out loud or you may want to do it in the quietness of your heart. But it goes something like this. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross in order to pay the price for all of my sins. I know that I have done wrong. I've broken your law and I've broken your heart. Forgive me. Change me. Right now, by faith, I accept your gift of eternal life. And I thank you for it. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer and you, you really meant it, then I encourage you, speak to someone who you know is a Christian. Go to a church. Tell the leaders what you've done. And get yourself a Bible. Begin to read. I, I'd suggest start with the, 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 we call it the gospel, but it's, it's the book of Mark. It's like two thirds of the way into the Bible. Start reading about Jesus in the book of Mark. It's only 16 chapters. Um, don't 
don't uh, start with Genesis chapter 1. Um, first get to know Jesus before you, you read that. Life is now about Jesus. Find out who he is. Begin to talk to him, pray to him, and then sit back and watch as God turns your life around. May God bless you.